Welcome to Citizens Forum. My name is Walter McGinnis, and uh, today we have with us uh, Sharon Noble. And uh, Sharon, of course, is uh, a long, long time activist in uh, bringing uh, issues to the public and to make awareness of the issues around the safety and the hazards around electromagnetic radiation, such as that emitted from cell phones, Wi-Fi, and all the other electronic gizmos that we have in our, in our possession. Now, uh, recently uh, there was a case at the, in the Human Rights Tribunal in, in uh, British Columbia that a grandmother and a mother and a, that were brought forward uh, in which they were asking for uh, a school board to make accommodations for their child who was suffering ill effects uh, as a result of being exposed to the Wi-Fi in school. So uh, that dragged on for a few years, but anyway, they finally made a decision that wasn't really friendly to the, to, the, to the family. And Sharon has looked over this issue and very carefully and looked at how the decision was made. And, and there are some issues that should be discussed. So that's why Sharon's here today. Welcome, Sharon, to the show. Thank you, Walt. So, okay, I don't know if I introduced that all well enough, but if you want to go over just basically what, uh, what this issue was before the tribunal, and basically what was the ruling? The history is a long one. Approximately six years ago, when the boy was seven years old, he started getting terrible migraines at school. Migraines that were so bad that he would start vomiting and he was having night tears, not sleeping well. The mother and the grandmother took him to all sorts of doctors. They took him to a neurologist who could find nothing wrong. It con he continued to get sick. Yeah. Took him to a pediatrician did all sorts of tests, could find nothing wrong. And about that time, the mother um, was told by someone at the school that they had just put in Wi-Fi modems, heavy duty commercial Wi-Fi modems. And she had just become familiar with the issue. And so she went to the principal and said, look, kids are not using computers in the school. Can you please turn the modem off just for a few days and let me see what happens? Yeah. And he said, no, I can't. That would be a dangerous precedent. He refused to do it. So the grandmother, the mother was working a full-time, um, you know, she worked full-time and the grandmother was the caregiver before and after school. So the grandmother said, well, I'm going to keep him home from school for a couple of days and see what happens. Because on the weekend, he's fine. Yeah. Kept him home. He was fine. Took him back to school. It started again. Yeah. And all year long, it was back and forth and back and forth. The next year, she found a school that did not have Wi-Fi. She had to drive this child 40 minutes each way to the school, when the school was just a block away from her house. And he was fine. He completed two years worth of school there, no problems. I don't think he missed a sick, a sick day. Then the school, even though it said it was going to be bringing in Wi-Fi for only 25% of the school, brought it in and the child started getting sick again. Yeah. He started having migraines. So she found another school without Wi-Fi. I mean, this went on for like four or five years. Yeah. She went to the school board, she tried to present the arguments, she pro provided scientific evidence. She had experts like Dr. Martin Blank testify on her behalf, and the school boards basically brushed her off. The individual schools tried their best. Without turning off the Wi-Fi, one year, the, the poor child spent in a basement room all by himself. He was with no children. He, the teacher would come down once or twice a day just to make sure he was still there. But he was lonely. He had absolutely no social interaction. And he didn't want to go back to school. Even though he was feeling fine, yeah. of course, he didn't want to go back to school. So the, the grandmother arranged for homeschooling. Meanwhile, she's trying to get accommodation. Yeah. And for many years, she was trying to get the schools to figure out what was going on. And she went to the Human Rights Tribunal when the schools could no longer accommodate him. She's been, he's been homeschooled with a tutor for, I believe, close to three years now. Right. And the only interaction is what the grandmother can find. Um, now, the mother moved in uh, with her two children, with the mother, when she moved out into the country. She's now living on a 6.6 acre place. She gave up her home of 43 years because they were putting in smart meters and they were putting in microcells. 
and she wanted to go someplace that was safe for her grandson. The only time the child is healthy and feeling good is when he's away from Wi-Fi, smart meters, or anything that's wireless. And this is the only way you can clearly diagnose <clears throat> electrosensitivity right now, yeah. is to remove the source or remove the person from the source. Yeah. And she applied for the Human Rights Tribunal to intervene. Now, Walt, about three or four years ago, you might remember, the BC Teachers Federation asked in their annual meeting for accommodation. There are teachers who are disabled and they want to continue working in a Wi-Fi free environment. And they asked if there could be one school per level, per division, without Wi-Fi. Now we both know that all schools had fiber optic cable, they had internet access long ago. Wi-Fi is not necessary for education. Wi-Fi, in fact, is slower, it's less efficient, it can be hacked, yeah. and it makes people sick. But for some reason, everyone has in their mind, you have to have Wi-Fi for a 21st century education. <laughs> How many times have we heard that? I know. So this is the conundrum. What do you do? You try to find a school. The teachers were never accommodated. Yeah. Their request for one school per division was never realized. Yeah. Now one of the schools, in fact, wrote something out. They sent out to the, te the, to the parents right. and said that they were going to be introducing 70% Wi-Fi in three Saanich middle schools. Okay. They s advised the parents, yeah. which is unusual, which is good. Yeah. And at the bottom of the, the advisory they said, Please note that if we move forward with increasing Wi-Fi, we will commit to providing a Wi-Fi free environment for students who request it. Well, that's interesting. Wasn't so that was wonderful? The problem? It never happened. <laughs> it never happened. This mother and grandmother were waiting for it to happen because they thought this is the answer. Yeah. It never happened. So this was part of her human rights complaint. Okay. Under the charter, Every child has a right to an education. Exactly. So, look, you know, what's the mechanics of it? Like, is, if I have a complaint uh, of concern and I and nobody is addressing it, and there's a human rights tribunal that's supposed to look after my interests. Yes. So, what happened when when she approached the human rights tribunal, and they spent a couple of years, didn't Three they? Three years. Now, what was the ruling? Did they did they rule? Did they say there's absolutely no harm? Uh, or, they, or did they say, are we going to hear this? Or what, what They did wouldn't even have a hearing. The ruling, if you read it, Walt, yeah. is one of the most bizarre rulings. I'm not a lawyer. Yeah. This guy, now, uh, the Human Rights Tribunal is one person. They yeah. call it a panel. It's one person. So, that's, so when I go, say if I had a complaint and, and one person handles my file, yes. let's say. So that, that's it. That's it. So they review my complaint and they themselves can decide whether or not it has merit. It has, yep, exactly. And this lawyer based it on information, for instance, from the, the BC Health Authority, yeah. Dr. Perry Kendall, who is now retired, who we all know is no expert on electromagnetic radiation. The mother and grandmother put together and got statements, studies, reports. Seven, uh, 54, they comprised two three-inch binders. Three inches, that's a big binder. Yeah. They spent a lot of money getting all of this stuff printed. They have a separate binder with an index and an explanation of each study. Yeah. In the decision, Walter Rilkoff, who is the panel for this decision, right. said that all of these things were just too complicated and technical so he had to consider them as hearsay. Never once did he try to contact one of the experts for an explanation. Neither did he contact the, the mother or the grandmother to ask for help. Rather, he made his decision based on information that he got from Perry Kendall primarily, who has yeah. long said, despite years and years and years of scientific research and 23,000 studies that show that there's harm, yeah. including two very important ones that have just been out. Yeah. He decided, no, Perry Kendall says that there's no harm. There's no harm from this. And what's even stranger 
he said things like, well, the respondents say that there are, um, this is a quote, they, the respondents say that the alleged symptoms suffered are not a disability under the Human Rights Code. Well, I tried to find the Human Rights Code definition of disability. This is what the Human Rights Code says. Disability is a protected ground in all areas covered by the human rights legislation. Disability is not defined. Specific diseases are not named in the statute, allowing for a broad inter interpretation. Well, that makes sense. There's no definition yeah. of disability. Yet yeah. they're saying the symptoms do not meet the definition under the code. How can that be? It's impossible. They, what he's saying is factually incorrect. It makes no sense. Yeah. In another uh, version, it says the respondents do not agree that this child suffers from symptoms alleged, which were migraines, vomiting. How you can't really feign that. Yeah. Night terrors. They do not agree that he suffers these symptoms. Yet, let me just go through here just a oh, minute. It's... It says, and another, the respondents do not seriously dispute that the child suffers a disability. The thing is, is that what price are we paying for the, to allow this technology to be installed in schools? You know, uh, it seems to me that uh, it's, it's the parents, it's, it's the teachers, the principals, the administrators, they all sort of don't want to know. And they and don't that's even a sad allow the discussion. Do you know, yeah. in the schools that this grandmother and mother we're trying to address, they would not allow any discussion at parent uh, at PACA meetings. Yeah. They wouldn't allow her to stand outside with flyers yeah. to try to tell the parents. Now, there was a human rights decision last year, I believe, that said that one school district was supposed to post um, flyers so that parents knew that Wi Fi was there. They were supposed to put uh, notes on the modem. Yeah. So the teachers and children knew where the modems were. Yeah. This has not been done, even though the schools were told they had to do it. Yeah. This never occurred. They don't yeah. want to know. And I want desperately to ha understand. It has to be the money. Yeah. Follow the money. It's always the money. And I met with some school trustees um, three or four years ago during a, a conference that was here in Victoria. And I met with a couple of the trustees from Burnaby who did not like having Wi-Fi in their schools, yeah. but they were forced to. And one of the trustees told me that it cost more money because they had to bring in more IT specialists because it was so slow. Yeah. The teachers were complaining that the service was so slow after the disconnecting from fiber optics. So what do they do? They come in and throw in more routers, more radiation, you know, too, so everybody can fire up their computers and download the same the thing. The radiation levels are very, very high. Yeah. And they're, one of the reasons is they want the children to have to bring their own devices. Yeah. The de devices could be plugged in. There are such things as yeah. home plugs. They yeah. could, you know, go around. They're very inexpensive. Yeah. We have them in our home so that yeah. we can move our computer anywhere we want to. Yeah. I can move my laptop anywhere. Yeah. Safely. These yeah. could be, this could be well, done see, in schools. See, the technology is there, and and I think I think you know we're going to have a couple of minutes before we could, we're going to wrap up. And now, I would like to, if I could, yeah. Further about the HRT, this yeah. decision, not only the the Walter Wilkoff, who was the panel, not only said many incorrect things, he yeah. said many things that were not true. Yeah. For instance, in his decision, he said that he had not been provided with doctor's reports. He assumed that the child had been taken to a doctor's, but he had never seen a report. That is totally untrue. Yeah. I ask any parent, if you know that something is making your child sick, would you not do anything you could to have that child taken away from that environment? Yeah. This CBC article was so biased yeah. and so hurtful, and to yeah. this day, that reporter has not retracted, neither has she spoken with yeah. the lawyer. She didn't do anything in the effort in this, re this report yeah. to get both sides. Yeah. She never made an effort. 
and CBC should be ashamed of itself on this. Often we'll see the CBC dropping the ball and and showing basically that they're, where they're siding. You know, um, what what's the next step for this mother and and her child? Do, do, can they appeal this decision? They can appeal it, but it costs money. Yeah, they will have to pay more money for it. They've spent thousands and thousands and thousands of yeah. dollars. If they lose. It, or if they get an appeal, who does it go to? It goes back to the Human Rights Tribunal. Yeah. It goes back to the same people yeah. who've made these decisions before. Yeah. And if they decide to take it to the Supreme Court, they, if they lose, they have to pay the other side, the side's fees. Yeah. It can go into hundreds of thousands of dollars. You know, lawyers are expensive. And yeah. if it's a public organization paying these lawyers, as we discovered with BC Hydro, yeah. huge bucks. So I don't know what their next step is. Right. The lawyer who has been helping them, uh, she's a lawyer who's been donating a lot of her time to these, this yeah. family because she understands the issue yeah. of sensitivity. And yeah. I don't know, they're still trying to figure out what, is, what they're going to do, the next step is. But September's coming up and it's one more year for this child who's now 13 years old. Yeah. At crucial age where he should be allowed to go to school with his peers. Exactly. You know, uh, it's very troubling, very, very troubling for even for people that don't think this is a bona fide health concern. If you look at the process, I mean, everybody deserves a fair process. And, and I know when you look at the way that what this ruling and how it came about and how it was reported on, such huge biases are really being exposed here. And, uh, you know, as a society, you know, uh, we can disagree on all sorts of issues, but if we cannot allow a fair process to occur, the society in general uh, is diminished. Uh, the values in our society that we hold dear are diminished. Well, you know, and what's really troubling, Walt, is that even prior decisions, an earlier human rights um, panel looked at a complaint by someone who was suffering from the uh, because of her smart meter yeah she was suffering greatly and the consequence of that human rights decision it said that they acknowledged that there was a real case yeah of of, of i can't find it right now but they said that they acknowledged yeah that there is a a, a danger a pot real potential danger yeah. from exposure to microwave radiation yet this guy says no he won't acknowledge it and yeah. if there is, as this other tribunal acknowledged, yeah. a real risk of ex from exposure to microwave radiation, should children especially be exposed? Many scientists, yeah, independent right. scientists are saying children are the most vulnerable in our population. Yeah. And yet we are playing Russian roulette with these kids. This is the thing is that their chances we're taking, if, it, it only makes sense. Like if you were at about, uh, if you were wanting to eat a certain food and somebody reported Peanuts? you. Peanuts? Yeah, you'd say, well, okay, you have to stay away from that or you're going to become sick. Uh, why is it that we can't take that same approach to the, to the Wi-Fi radiation? Because there's no diagnostic test yet. Yeah. There are tests that are being developed. Yeah. And the tests that they're doing on animals is showing overwhelmingly. Yeah. In fact, we now know from recent studies that the scientists are pushing for it to be called a true carcinogen. Yeah. But all the neurological studies, all the other the health effects that we've seen yeah. are not in dispute anymore with most independent scientists. Right. But we need to have true diagnostic tests for yeah. electrosensitivity. And right now, there are a few but one of the big ones is our MRI. Yeah. And anybody who's sensitive cannot go near That's an right. MRI machine. They would yeah. suffer irreparable harm. You know, it, it seems that there's so many stumbling blocks in the process that, um, and we would think that there's some, some jurisdiction or some, some body it could appeal to. And, and when I look at the Human Rights Tribunal and the way they function, it's totally dysfunctional. You know, when there's a chance of harm, that's enough of a reason to, to take steps. In fact, we you should know. have a whole program on the precautionary principle. That's right. It's about time that anyway, we started Anyway, Sharon, we're going to have to leave it at that for now. Yes. But perhaps you can come back in the future and report 
be on happy ongoing to. events. Thank you so much for coming in. It's Thank been a pleasure. You all. So that wraps up this segment of Citizens Forum. Hi, welcome back. It's the uh, second segment of Citizens Forum. It is Wednesday, August the 1st. I'd like to just thank the volunteer crew and the Shaw staff that makes this program happen every couple of weeks. Uh, my guest is Mehdi Najari. And Mehdi, we're going to start off by talking about uh, the gambling, the casinos, the whatever the, the issue is. Yes, Jack, I, I, I look at this issue, I mean, we, I am familiar with it. I opposed uh, the gambling in 1990s when the NDP was pushing it. And I thought, the, we are not connecting the dots. You know, since late 1980s, the government was coming and dropping this uh, suggestion about expanding gambling, and, and the citizens were always opposed it. In 19, when the, when the NDP come to power, they, they ran as a anti-gambling, you know, platform. In but 1991? In 1991. And then they come to power by 1994, where they were pushing gambling. And they come and said, we want to have casino, uh, Las Vegas-style casinos. And people went crazy about it and say, no, we don't want. We don't want criminals to take over our city. We don't want money laundering. We don't want prostitution. We don't want gambling. And, citizen, and, and the municipalities also push, and they back off. But after the election in 2006, they come back and said, guess what? Yeah, in like 2006? Uh, 19, 1996. Okay, so the NDP's second term? Second term, and they come back and said, uh, we want to expand gambling. But this time, in the state of Las Vegas-style casino, we will have uh, Monaco-style casinos. <laughs> and people, again, went, you know, uh, because because they ran NDP ran uh, the election based on anti-gambling platform, and uh, Mr. Dan Miller at the time said, we, uh, when they asked him, "You are breaking your promise," he said, "No, we are not breaking promise. We are reconsidering our and Dan options." Dan Miller was the deputy premier, deputy premier and front man for this. And then we had, uh, if you remember, the NDP lost two premier because of gambling. One, Bingo Gate, uh, Mr. Hartcourt, has to resign. And one, uh, uh, Casino Gate, which Mr. Clark has to resign because of the connection to gambling and pushing through. Then uh, in, uh, in late 1990s, when the citizens were really working very hard against gambling, you know, Mr. Gordon Campbell, at that time the official leader of opposition, said uh, this is a good opportunity to become popular. So he jumped in front of the movement against gambling and said, we are not going to expand gambling because it would kill our children, destroy families, is bring prostitution, money laundering, and, and that, that, that in. So they opposed, and they ran the election 2001 based on anti-gambling. And they won. And they won. But within a few years, two, three years, the gambling was flourishing, and they pushed for expansion of gambling. You know, they, they disregard their own promises, and, and the media really didn't go much after them. And we have, I have articles from 2004, 2006, 2007, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, Many, many articles in the media, in Vancouver Sun, in Vancouver province, in other uh, media, that many articles were written about money laundering, the problem in, 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 the, in the casinos. And the government official always tried to disregard them, to say, no, there is not much problem. There was an in integrated illegal gambling enforcement team that was was created in 2003 to look at illegal gambling, not the casino gambling, but illegal gambling. And that, that team was doing very well, actually. They, they had raid in, in Burnaby, in, in Prince George, in Williams Lake, in Nanaimo, shutting down illegal gambling uh, places. And in, two, in January 2009, they came with the with a report that said that they are looking at the gambling problem in casinos is, is flourishing, 
money laundering, corruption, the organized crime is, is clearly is, is controlling this gambling. And that was January uh, 2009. By April, they get rid of this, this team, RCMP team. They didn't want it at all. And they made excuses that is because of the money, they are not doing their job, and all that was nonsense. They did not want anybody to look at the issue of gambling in casinos and money laundering. And then we saw in, in 2011, uh, uh, Constable Barry uh, Baxter of RCMP made comment about the, the organized crime taking over the, uh, the casinos, you know, and he was. Uh, Mr. Coleman called RCMP headquarters and silenced him. He was not allowed to talk about casino gambling anymore. You know? In 2014, uh, Joe Chalk, the senior director of investigation for BC Gam Gaming and Policy Enforcement Branch, was fired because he was uh, uh, expressing concern. So everybody knew exactly what was going on. The, everybody knew and, 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 and for example here is a headline from 2006 uh, Vancouver province. Lips turn blind eye to evil they warned against. Kid may die they said in opposition. So they were, they were, do, they were, they were, they knew what they are doing. And here is, here is an article in 2010 from Vancouver province again, again, Eton Barron wrote, the headline is Lax BCLC reporting let criminal flourish. I want to read two sentences from this article. The first one said, BC liberals are suckling so greedily at the tits of their gambling cash cow that they, that they are helping criminals destroy our community. The last sentence in this article said, it is clear that for the, for, the, for the Gordon Campbell government, raking in gambling loot is far more important than preventing criminals from exploiting the system. We are all paying the prices. And you look around today, we are paying the prices through the housing. The prices of housing is skyrocketing because a lots of money from the casinos and laundered through casinos is cleaned the money through the casinos and buying property and causing the, but besides that, look at the fentanyl problem. Most of these, most of the, the, the drug money is being laundered through the, through the gambling, uh, through the casinos, and all these people, young people are dying because of what the, both BC NDP and BC Liberals did in, in, in flourishing and, and, and pushing for expanded gambling. Last thing I wanna say about that, I, we don't have time, that it is, there is a lots of good people like like Sergeant, uh, Staff Sergeant, former Staff Sergeant uh, uh, Fred Pinnock that said in 2009 and again is saying he said that both RCMP brass and the BC government are responsible in this situation. We have a government right now, Premier John Horrigan, that was a was a uh, uh, lobby lobbyist for a slot machine. So John Horgan was a lobbyist for... Yes, he lobbied for 600 more slot machines in Plaza of Nation in 2003, 2004, December 2003 and January 2004. So he was working for so, the gambling industry. Yes, yeah, yeah. and so these, these two parties are not going to stop. They both, their hands are bloody with what's happened with the expanded gambling, with people are dying, and they are not going to uh, stop it. We are not going to have a meaningful inquiry. No, we're in, not. Into, and no prosecution. No. And Mr. Coleman has the, has the guts to come and say, I did everything I could, and, and we see he didn't do anything. You know? And he, anybody that suggests otherwise is, uh, is saying load of garbage. That's what he's... Who is Mr. Coleman? Coleman was in charge of... Uh, the, the gambling, uh, the, the casino and lottery file uh, for most of the uh, 16 years of uh, BC Liberal in power. Oh, Rich Coleman. Rich Coleman. Oh, Rich Coleman, sorry. Okay, yeah, yeah. It just shows the depth of the problems we have here. 
You wanted to talk about uh, CFAX. I, I, I want to talk about CFAX because we, we are being, uh, the CFAX especially, and when I say CFAX, I'm just talking about Adam Sterling's show in the morning. I'm not talking about other shows because I think they are doing not bad job. They are, they are doing I don't agree with you, but. Job. But what Adam Sterling is doing, he has become a lobbyist for the, for the fossil fuel industry, pushing their interest. He is saying, for example, that he has been in the campaign, of smear campaign against environmentalists, saying that environmentalists are misinfor misinformed public, you know, for more than a year and a half. Some of the things he said is very interesting. For example, he said, we, the, when environmentalists are saying that, uh, that uh, Betjeman uh, sink, they are misinforming public. Why? Because there is a, uh, there is a, a report by Royal Society of Canada, it's about 480 page report, that say it doesn't. Page 160, he repeat this in order to impress the listeners that page 160 and page 176 said that Betjeman uh, was leaked to the uh, marine environment at it, and it didn't sink. First of all, he doesn't tell people that that report was commissioned by the oil industry. By, uh, by Canadian Energy Pipeline Association and Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers. They pay for the report. They set up the terms of reference. But even with all that, and with all that, when you look at those pages, 160 and 376, it never sets what Mr. Adam Sterling claimed. It was in page, for example, 160, the report said, that unpublished report, unpublished report, unpublished report said that the, uh, when the, when the Betjeman leaked to the ocean, and, and this is from the incident in Burnaby in 2007, it was a pipeline was punctured in the land. On the land. And right. On the land, and some of the Betjeman, uh, through the uh, sewage uh, uh, pipes, went to the ocean, and the report, the unpublished report is from who? From Kinder Morgan. It's not being verified by independent scientists. So the, so the problem with the uh, Royal Society of Canada report is that they allow unpublished reports without any very independent verification to become uh, part of the evidence, report, yeah. part of evidence, which is nonsense. He also claimed that, for example, that in 2000, uh, uh, that, that the in environmentalists are claiming that we, uh, that sevenfold increase in, 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 be, in, in, in tanker traffic in Salish Sea. All I heard from him again and again, he has been saying this for t uh, a year and a half. Environmentalists always said that there is sevenfold increase in betterment shipment in the Salish Sea or sevenfold increase in tanker traffic in, in Burrard Inlet. And he is claiming that environmentalists are lying to public, trying to deceive the public, but he never bring an environmentalist there to pose the question in, to them and ask them. I want to just read you one of the, because we don't have time, I just read you one, uh, one sentence here. Okay. Here is what, uh, he, has a, he has a guest on, on a regular basis, Markham Hislop. And this is Markham Hislop said, what is come in, on my, May 15, 2018, what is come down to is folks like you and I, he's talking to Adam Sterling, who, uh, folks like you and I who are in the media and are shaping the narrative around project like this, Kinder Morgan project, this, and around the energy industry need to be able to trans translate that into something that average listeners can understand. So he is really saying that we are shaping the narrative. And they are. And, and, and they are. And, other, and there is many, many other examples of how Mr. Sterling is misinforming public covertly. And when he says there is an open line, when we call, when I call, I'm not I'm not allowed in. I filed a complaint with the CRTC, the regulatory, federal regulatory body, and of course, 
the CRTC is run by the industry, the corporations, just like the rest of the federal government, so that got nowhere. Mehdi, thank you very much, and thank you for watching this segment of Citizens Forum. Hello, and welcome to another segment of uh, Citizens Forum. My name is Kalen Harris, and today uh, joining me is a uh, volunteer coordinator for Victoria, for Lead Now Victoria, um, and her name is Tessa Owens, and we are here, we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, the campaign for proportional representation in British Columbia. So uh, welcome, first of all, hello. Hello. Uh, how are you doing today? <laughs> good, good. Great. <laughs> So um, I'll fill you in kind of where, what we've talked about a little bit, and I'd like you to kind of just jump in wherever you feel inspired. Mm -hmm. um, so thus far, we've talked um, to a number of uh, researchers and other organizers talking about um, you know, the systems. We've talked about uh, the reasons why we might want to change um, kind of on a broader level and a little bit higher level, academic level. Um, and I think your role within Lead Now is really interesting to talk maybe a little about specifics. So, um, first of all, uh, Lead Now is an organization. Yeah, maybe you can just kind of fill, it, fill in the viewers uh, to yeah. what Lead Now is all about. For sure. So, they're a non governmental organization um, and they're primarily volunteer driven. So, if you can imagine, Lead Now takes on a bunch of projects and it would seem like they have a staff of couple thousand people based on all the things that they take on but really there's only 10 employees or around 10 employees um, on the staff at one time um, and so they're primarily volunteer based that's where the bulk of the energy comes from that's where the drive for initiatives comes from and there's about 500,000 volunteers across Canada that are connected to lead now um, so it's, it's great um, the way they choose the issues to focus on is done very democratically actually they will email volunteers ask them to fill out a survey, ask them what issues they think Lead Now should be focusing on in BC, in Canada. Um, there's also a really strong base in Ontario, so there's a big focus there as well. Great. And so that, that would make sense then that uh, you're probably uh, getting a lot of, um, I guess, uh, well, I guess your role as a, as, a, as a volunteer coordinator, specifically on the proportional representation campaign, mm -hmm. means that there's a lot of volunteers in British Columbia that are interested in seeing this go forward, right? Exactly, yes. So this is one of two campaigns that um, Lead Now is focusing on in BC, the first being proportional representation and the second being the Kinder Morgan pipeline. Two huge issues, eh? Yes. <laughs> Very cool. So um, then, like, what are you doing? You're doing. You're a, you're a student, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, what's where do you go to school normally? I go to a school called Minerva. Oh, okay, um, where's that? It's actually it's hard to explain. <laughs> the headquarters are in San Francisco, but uh, I travel with a cohort of students, and we study in a different country every semester. So that's all right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and what are you studying? I'm doing a, a degree in Bachelor of Arts called Politics, Government, and Society. Oh, and very I'm doing, cool. Yes, very relevant. Yes. And a Bachelor of Science in Earth Systems. Awesome. So um, what got you into LEAD Now? Like, how was, uh, yeah, how'd you land here for the summer? Yeah, um, well, LEAD Now, I've always really admired the work that they do. They reach so many people. They kind of, seems like they're spread on almost every topic um, that matters, to, in my opinion. So I think it's great. I've been a fan for a long time. Um, primarily, I connected with LEAD Now on environmental, environmental issues that they've taken on. Uh, I'm really passionate about sustainability, sustainable development. That's what I want to work on. Um, so when I found an opportunity to work with LEAD Now this summer, I was really excited. It's not necessarily a campaign that's exactly environmentally focused, but it has a tie-in for sure. Certainly. Yeah, I mean, I think there's, uh, there's a ton of arguments to be made about uh, you know, environmental policies uh, that are kind of world-leading are mm -hmm. resulting uh, from often proportional government models uh, around the world, right? Right, absolutely. Um, so what kinds of people are you seeing kind of come to the, the movement? Because, of course, mm -hmm. uh, the ca official campaign started in July, July 1st, I think, actually. Right. Um, and uh, so who's been getting on board? Uh, like, who's, who's coming to you saying, like, sign me up, let me help? Mm -hmm. Actually, the bulk of volunteers are those that are retired. Oh. Um, it's interesting, um, and I, I feel like it's great. They have a lot more time and more resources yeah. than many young people my age do. It seems like we're all running from job to job. Mm -hmm. I actually have a couple of part-time jobs <laughs> on top of this that I'm working on. So, yeah, bulk of our volunteers are retired. Um, and we do have a few young volunteers. Um, they seem to be connected to some kind of like high school political system that they came out of or like a political course. A lot of them are studying poli-sci in a university, have a couple people that are really interested in philosophy. Uh, one of the volunteers on the campaign, actually, he has never volunteered before in his life. He's in his early 20s, wow. but uh, he decided to come on to this campaign because he thought 
It was really exciting and he's been loving it. So that's, that's one of the great things is to have volunteers come on who are brand new. Yeah, I, I mean, I think kind of um, having certainly an older cohort, cohort as part of the, the, the kind of core volunteer group mm -hmm. um, certainly helps build that and foster that kind of sense of activism or engagement rather, citizen yeah. engagement. Um, over the course of a lifetime. That's mm -hmm. kind of cool. Um, and as far as like, you know, you're, I, I don't want to be rude, I guess, to some of our, our, our viewers, but um, are we talking like the older hippie types? Are we talking like, are, are there professionals that are engaged? Like wh what kind of backgrounds are you seeing come to, uh, come to lead now for mm -hmm. uh, this campaign? I think it's all over, all across the board. There are definitely older hippie types. <laughs> um, there's definitely older, very professional people who are still working, um, still involved in business, law, being doctors um, and this issue I think is just it's so great because it's pulling in all these people from different sectors of society um, it's a nonpartisan issue it doesn't really fall under one party's domain um, in BC and I think that's why we're seeing so many different people come out of the woodwork on this mm -hmm. because it's an issue just about fairness about protecting our democracy um, yeah so I feel like everyone can connect and is you know you've mentioned fairness and, and democ democratic values mm -hmm. but is there um, are there, are there any, any other kind of like uh, interesting stories that, uh, you know, like people are like, you know what, uh, the, uh, you know, the 39% uh, victory of a majority uh, mm -hmm. was the thing that got me involved. Or if there are there people that were, you know, liberal voters that were saying like, you know, I can't believe that in, what was it, 96 or something like that, right. you know, the NDP got uh, fewer votes than us and they ended up with a majority of government. Like, we're, yeah. what's, uh, like, give us some, is, are there any stories that you can think of uh, off the top of your head that uh, would be interesting or that you've, you've kind of come across? Yeah, for sure. So it's, whenever I explain to people the way that proportional representation works, where the percentage of the votes a party gets equals the percentage of seats they get in the House, so usually the, the answer that I'm met with is, doesn't that, isn't that how our system works right now? And it's just because it's intuitive. That's what people expect from our current electoral system. But it's, it's true. Um, with less than 40% of the vote, a party can get a majority government. Then they can have 100% uh, of the power. And when people realize that, put two and two together, they kind of realize that that's not a, a government system that they want to represent them. Uh, so a lot of people have been motivated by that fact in particular. Um, one thing I was telling a group of volunteers yesterday is that 15 out of the last 17 elections in BC have resulted in a false majority. So I think that's a statistic that really speaks to a lot of people. Yeah, I, I think you're spot on actually. That's, mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems like a, a um like a, a really kind of shaking kind of like realization, like how, you mean our system is completely functioning t for a minority of people? Like that, yeah. it's, it's funny, I, I think I saw on Twitter uh, the other day, a, a guy was talking about how, you know, this system has worked well for 150 years. And it's mm -hmm. like, has it actually worked well? And for whom has it worked? And like, right. has it actually been this system? Cause like we had multi-member writings even into the nineties hmm. or the eighties anyways, like, it's, I think there's there's so much disinformation out there that it's really nice to have, like you said, um, kind of nonpartisan um, information and just kind of like people saying, look, this is this is good for democracy. This is good for um, you know all these great other uh, wonderful reasons. And um, yeah, so like, is there um, is there something that uh, Lead Now is kind of focusing on? Because of course, it is uh, already been a very partisan uh, conversation. The, uh, the the NDP have been accused of rigging this in the back rooms of things, and of course. Uh, the the liberals are you know are, are being you know uh, screamed at for being you know anti-democratic and right? I mean that which is I think false on both accounts. Right. So um, how important do you would you say that uh, that lead now or lead now and organizations like lead now in this referendum are going to be? I think they're going to make all the difference. The government is launching an educational campaign, um, and they're going to be I guess sending out resources on the three types of proportional representation systems that have been proposed. So that's the rural, urban, the dual member, and the mixed member proportional. Mm -hmm. So they will be uh, releasing materials about, about those systems in September. But September is right before October, which is when the official uh, referendum period opens. So organizations like Lead Now and Fair Vote, I think, believe that we should probably start educating people as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. um, just because the people who are opposed to this issue, they say that um, proportional representation is too complicated, it's too difficult to understand. So we're really fighting that argument by educating people, explaining it in a few short sentences. It's easy to grasp mm -hmm. um, and just getting as much information as we can out there. Cool. And so you're talking about how Lead Now has a very big on online presence, but you were mm -hmm. talking to a room of, uh, of volunteers yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, what else are you guys doing? Like, what uh, what kind of activities are you, you doing that uh, in, in order to get the, the word out? 
Right, so primarily we talk to people on the phone. Um, and those are people that are connected to Lead Now, so we don't just talk to random members of the public. It's people who've signed our petitions in the past or connect with us in some way. Mm -hmm. uh, so we just have real live person phone calls. We're, we don't send any out. Uh, any robocalls. Oh, Sometimes. I love those. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it's sad because people will answer the phone and they think that we're a robocall just because they've already gotten them right. uh, from the no side. Oh, yeah. Uh, so yes, uh, phone calls are primarily how we're reaching the bulk of people. Right. Um, then we go to farmers markets. We talk to people at farmers oh, markets great. about um, the issue. A lot of volunteers actually prefer the face-to-face -face conversation. So yeah, that works well for them. Yeah, that's, that's actually a really good point is that when you have uh, people-powered movements, um, you get people actually on the phones, looking to have conversations, looking mm -hmm. to connect. Um, and uh, whereas people who are, you know, there's there's money behind the interests, and they're they're you know they're clearly buying uh, <laughs> phone calls. And of course, those phone calls happen at like 400 a, a minute, mm -hmm. as opposed to you know one every four minutes sometimes, depending right. on the phone banking. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, that's that's really interesting. Uh, do you, are you uh, are you affiliated with any of the other yes uh, proponents? Are you are, is Lead Now uh, operating alone, or is it coordinated? Yeah, so there's a bunch of different groups that are working on this issue. I've only named Fair Vote, but there's a dozen others. Um, and we're all part of a coalition, and we're organizing our strategies together to make sure that our limited resources are used in the best and most efficient way possible. Um, so we now is in meetings uh, all the time with these different groups, figuring out how to you know, share resources, share people, share time. Cool. Yeah. Now I, I know that you're not, uh, you know, a key organizer in the middle of everything, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, like I think, uh, you know, I've been involved in a couple of campaigns before and um, of, of various things, and um, I think you get a sense from the top down uh, how uh, how things are going. Right. Um, would you say that uh, the people in, in Lead Now and the organization are, are fairly optimistic this time around? Oh yeah, we yeah. have a big chance this time um, compared to where we had to win a super majority, 60% plus. Um, on the last referendums. This one, we just need 50% plus one. And from the conversations that I've been having across Victoria, more than 50% of people, it seems, are saying yes. Mm -hmm. More than 50%, um, even, even if they don't know about proportional representation when you first introduce the concept to them, just after a short conversation where you explain how it works, it just makes sense to everyone. Everyone's on board. So people say that they'll be voting yes. So give me your best little elevator pitch here. Like, so <laughs> if, I'm, if you've met me, met me on, the first, uh, on the street, I've never uh, met you before. Mm -hmm. I don't know anything about uh, electoral reform, proportional representation. I think that I go cast my ballot and it, it ends up in a government that reflects my wishes. Right. So uh, I'm going to say probably we don't need to fix what if it, if it ain't broken don't fix it right. Mm. So what's uh, what's what's your elevator pitch like? What, how's how do you how do you change my mind? Right. So one of the things that I'll talk about is voter turnout in BC. So voter, voter turnout is really low. A lot of people feel like their votes don't count. It's just a ballot that they cast away um, because they have to vote strategically. It's like you don't actually get to vote for the people that you want to represent you. It's like you're voting against the devil or something. You're trying to avert the devil with mm -hmm. your vote. Um, but with proportional representation, you can cast your vote according to how you actually want to vote. Every vote would count. Um, and it would result in a parliament that is you know, multifaceted, has different representation from different perspectives, and when they build policies together, it represents more of the people. It's not a policy that's coming from less than 40% of the population uh, that leaves out the majority of people. Um, and I think in the future, it could really inspire a culture of politics that's renewed, refreshed, where people actually pay attention to news more than just the headlines, um, don't scoff at politics, and actually remember to vote. Man, I'm convinced. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, like, I think uh, I would uh, I would agree with you on all of those things. I think um, you know the opportunity for a, a robust uh, electoral system that requires good ideas to be filtered through oppositions uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, uh, and and you know a collaborative process. I mean, for me, that's that's why I'm voting for proportional representation, and I really appreciate you coming on today to, to you know give people the sense of what Lead Now is doing. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we've had on the screen a couple of times. Leadnow.ca is uh, is the website for the organization, and they can probably uh, get involved through that website. Yeah? Yes, absolutely. Very We're cool. always looking for volunteers. Well, Tessa, <laughs> it was a pleasure. Uh, thank again, you. thank you very much for coming, and uh, thank you all for joining us again for another ep or another segment of uh, Citizens Forum. Welcome back. It's the Walt and Jack show. Uh, I've got a few things, Walt, but do you have anything to... Well, I would like to comment. You just, you've got a lot of topics there, and I'll just comment on what you're talking about. So the forest fires. Um, 
It's amazing. You know, I was thinking the other day, imagine if a group of terrorists came over from somewhere. Probably they would be funded by the CIA, as most of the terrorist groups in the world seem to be, including ISIS. And if you Google U.S. funds ISIS, you'll see that. But imagine a group of terrorists came over and burnt down a thousand houses in, yeah. uh, in California and killed a bunch of people. And uh, 40,000 people had to leave their homes because of blah. Can you imagine CNN and, you know, can you imagine? But because it's climate change and it's forest fires, yeah. which is exactly what's happening right now across the United States, really, but especially in California, it's like not really news. They can't get off of Trump and Russia. Russia is undermining U.S. democracy, which has to be the biggest joke in the world because there is no democracy in the United <laughs> States. It's been undermined by corporate America. I think for the last, well, they killed Kennedy. So certainly, I mean, for the last 70, 80, 100 years, I mean, is there any democracy? And yet that is the enemy while the fires burn in California and the floods in the East Coast and the poles melt and it just gets crazier. I, I, I honestly Well, it's all locked up. You know, I was listening to CBC last night and they were talking about the, the idea of fake news, how these journalists were real journalists and they're bringing this information forward. And they, in the recent poll showed that 83% of the population in the United States, and probably the same in Canada, don't trust the mainstream media. That doesn't buy what they're saying. You know, they're always questioning. And they really can't understand how it could be. Of course, they're saying in the era of the Trump era of fake news and how Trump calls everything fake news. Well, the thing is, there is fake news. Well before Donald Trump arrived, the corporate media has been lying to us. About everything. So uh, we now have to become a Donald Trump supporter. We're in the Donald Trump camp now if we call them on their lies. Yeah, yeah, so isn't yeah. that convenient? But the thing is, too, and what I was really thinking about this, these are smart people and, and uh, professionals and really know how to gather information and all that. How can it be that they can't understand that the corporations that they're working for that shape and frame these stories and tell them what, what's, what they're going to cover are they not questioning their bosses and saying, well, hang on here, there's more to this story, like, say, the climate change story, and the, especially with the Kinder Morgan, uh, Pierre, or not Pierre Trudeau, but Justin Trudeau. I mean, this is a story that... We're arresting people throats. today, still, who are blocking the Kinder Morgan pipeline yeah. as smoke wafts over Vancouver. Yeah. And the people who are trying to stop the pipeline are going to jail. Yeah. And the people behind it are getting $4 billion <laughs> from us. I know. Uh, but whole towns are burning, Jack. Yeah. Whole, you know, whole uh, hundreds of square kilometers are burning across Canada. But also, there's a heat wave all the way around uh, the nor uh, northern hemisphere right now. Um, we are in a crisis, and, and we have the CBC, these journalists holding themselves up to being, you know, the, the, the bringers of truth. Can't they make that distinction? Can't they even allow themselves to perhaps speculate on that? No. It's either their version of the news or you have to be a Donald Trump supporter. There's nothing in the middle. Yeah. And here in BC, it's the same. We've got, uh, you know, the Horgan government approved Site C, which is a climate change disaster um, because of the methane that's released when you create a reservoir. Uh, John Horgan also says he doesn't see a business case for trains. No, we've all got to be driving cars. There's no business case for trains. And when he said that, the media said, oh, okay, no business case for trains, goodbye. No business case for trains. Jack, there's no business case for public transportation. We're not talking about business. We're talking about moving people safely and conveniently yeah. and, and to enhance our lives. That's we organize, yeah. we organize our societies around these things. We're, we don't have to make a profit on public transportation. Yes. The only thing we can spend the money on is subsidizing the cars. For, for the cost of the uh, McKenzie overpass, yeah. we could have 
uh, trains going right to downtown. We could even put in a new rail bridge to downtown yeah. and still have 20 or 30 million dollars left over. On the ENN line, which runs right from Langford to downtown, the track is there, but it, we, they won't do it because our governments are totally corrupt. They are run by big business. And the media is totally corrupt. It's run by big business. And as long as they control the story and they control the government, what chance do we have to get anywhere? Well, one thing that could happen is that we might have a different electoral system in British Columbia, and these sort of shenanigans are not going to work. That would certainly work. help. And that's why, of course, the no side does not want PR, because it is a little more, demo it's a lot more democratic. It gives us more of a voice, and the voice of the 1% in the media goes down a little bit. So that's, that's, um, it's a mess, Walt. I really don't see how we're going to, and the, uh, the economy is in similar shape, unfortunately. Yeah. So I don't know, I, I, I don't know where we're going. Well, we're kind of in an era when it, it's all, I mean, you want to talk about what's fake. The U.S. economy is fake. There's no U.S. economy. There are trillions of dollars in debt. They're never going to pay their public debt. So how, when the Dow Jones is ticking up or if employment's going up in, in their society, or what does that really mean? It doesn't mean anything. They inject a trillion dollars into the economy to try, to try to stimulate it. It goes right into the pockets of the banksters and nothing happens. <laughs> you know, they just all got bonuses, you know. So th that, that has to change for sure. Good luck to us all and uh, thank you, Walt. Always a pleasure, Jack. And thank you for watching this segment of Citizens Forum, and I really mean do good luck to us all.